Welcome, introductory psychology students. Wubba lubba dub dub. Today we're gonna talk about chapter 16, or if we're not using the OpenStax books, therapy and treatment. That's right. So, in the previous chapter, we talked about all the disorders and that all of them have the impairment of your ability to function on a daily basis in common. So, now let's talk about how we treat those things. I'm going to try to do this in 10 minute intervals. So here we go. This is part one. Don't know how many parts there's going to be, but we'll check it out. Here's the outline, breaking it down. We're going to talk about psychotherapy versus biomedical therapy. We're going to talk about the psycho <laughs> psychoanalytic therapy. Uh, and when you hear the word psycho, you should be thinking Sigmund Freud. Who came up with psychoanalysis? Sigmund Freud. Who came up with the psychodynamic theory of personality? Sigmund Freud. So anyway, when you hear psycho, think of Sigmund Freud. And it's all about the unconscious and revealing it. Then we're going to talk about the humanistic therapy. Oh, when you hear humanistic therapy, you should be thinking Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. They're the masters of love. Basically, Carl Rogers says that in order to really heal anyone, you have to give them unconditional positive regard, kind of like unconditional love. Maslow says just meet their needs. Moving on to behavioral therapy, you should think of John B. Watson and B. F. Skinner, the famous behaviorists. That's all about training your disorders away. That's right, you got a problem? We're going to train it away, just like Pavlov trained those dogs. Then you have cognitive therapy, right? Cognitive therapy is, you know what? I'm really curious why this isn't going full screen here because I got this little block down here and that's really annoying. So it's cutting off the little bottom here. So I apologize about that. You get to see the bottom of my window. Not sure, show presenter view? No, that's not it. Look at this, hide presenter view, yeah. How do I do this? Oh well, oh well. I guess we're just going to have to go ahead and have that bottom cut off. So cognitive therapy. Anyway, sorry about the interruption. Cognitive therapy, cognition, fancy word for thinking. So when you hear cognitive therapy, it's all about changing your thinking. You're sad, you got problems, you're thinking wrong. So in cognitive therapy, we're going to change your thinking. Let's dive into this. Boom, boom. So biomedical therapy versus psychotherapy. What's the difference? Drugs? or no drugs. It's pretty simple. Biomedical therapy pretty much consists of anything that treats your body, and psychotherapy is something that doesn't treat your immediate physiology. So simply said, biomedical therapy, use of medications and other medical therapies, and psychotherapy, use of psychological techniques. For biomedical therapy, think of it as drugs, electroshock therapy, and also lobectomies, which we typically don't use anymore. Those are the three common ones. Oh my goodness, I didn't even close Skype down. You see that Kalen's available? Better to close down all this stuff. This is getting embarrassing, guys. Anyway, the show must continue. So, biomedical therapies, most common one, drugs. Psychotherapy, we're going to spend the rest of the chapter talking about those. So let's talk more about my biomedical therapy right now. So, biomedical therapies. Electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. This is the old fashioned strap someone down and electrocute them. There used to be problems with breaking people's bones, zap zap, breaking their ligaments, zap zap, having all sorts of problems. We used to use it for all sorts of things, including a form of torture. You got a patient that's acting up in a psych ward, well, let's just run some electricity through them. But we've cracked down on that, and the good question is do we still use electroconvulsive therapy? Absolutely we do, zap zap. But what do we use it for? Do we use it for schizophrenia and all sorts of disorders? No, we only use it for one disorder. And this will be a question on your final exam. For what disorder do we usually treat? I mean, for which disorder do we use electroconvulsive therapy for? The answer is major depressive disorder. Question is why? Why do we treat people with depression by electrocuting them? The answer is because it works. How does it work? We're not really quite sure. We think that the electricity is the equivalent of restarting your computer because it forces your neurons to release all those neurotransmitters they have in there. So your brain just becomes saturated with all the neurotransmitters. And it takes a while 
for your brain to reabsorb those, reuptake, right? So after a couple days, feel right as rain. And it's interesting, we only use it for last case scenarios. And it's kind of like a prescription. We only give you a little zap zap at first, then we give you a little bit more zap zap. And if that's still not working, then zap zap zap. And people come back. I've administered electroconvulsive therapy before and people swear by it. But again, we only use it for major depressive disorder. Do we still have problems with broken bones and ligaments from people shaking around and resisting against the straps? No. Why? Because we can chemically paralyze someone temporarily now. Ketamine, my friends, ketamine. The only thing that really moves when we electrocute them nowadays is their cute, adorable toes. Curl a little bit. Curl. It's an amazing thing to watch. Anyway, then we have the psychotropic medications. We're going to talk about antipsychotics, anti-anxiety meds known as benzodiazepines, lithium, and antidepressants. Let's talk about those right now. So antipsychotics, simply used to treat schizophrenia. There's old school antipsychotics and there's new school antipsychotics. The old school antipsychotics, no, formerly known as neuroleptics, we still call them neuroleptics. It's a general term to mean antipsychotics, but these old school antipsychotics, these neuroleptics, lower dopamine levels. And if you remember from earlier chapters, dopamine is your reward center. It makes you feel good. But if you don't have enough dopamine, then you have Parkinson's disease. You have the shakes. So do people who have uh, schizophrenia, they have too much dopamine on their brain, and if we give them antipsychotics, might they start showing movement problems? Absolutely. So then we came up with atypical antipsychotics, which altered the dopamine levels and also altered serotonin. You're looking at your Abilifys and your Zyprexa. And the interesting thing is if you've seen commercials for Abilify, they don't advertise it as an antipsychotic. They advertise it as an antidepressant modifier. How can it modify your antidepressants? Well, because it gives you that serotonin. And if you recall, people that are depressed have serotonin levels that aren't usually high enough. So that's why Abilify is now being marketed as an antidepressant modifier. Pretty interesting stuff. But enough about antipsychotics, let's move on to anti-anxiety medications. These are your benzodiazepines, your benzos. Pretty simple here. Your anti-anxiety medications are used to treat anxiety disorders. It gets you drunk in a pill because it increases your level of GABA. Remember, GABA just inhibits your brain. You have that neurotransmitter, that makes you dumber. So why is it that you shouldn't wash down your Valium or your Xanax with your alcohol, your Jimmy Bean, your vodka? Because too much GABA just slows your brain down. And if your brain gets really slow, you don't even have enough brain power to live. So they're very dangerous and they're very addictive too. Just like alcohol is addictive. If someone's taking too much benzodiazepines, we can't have them go cold turkey because if they suddenly quit, their withdrawal symptom is too much brain activity, they could seize out and die. So we have to wean people off of these. My advice is don't get addicted to drugs. Don't even mess around with that stuff, right? All right, so what else do we have besides our Valium and Xanax, our benzodiazepines, our anti-anxieties? Well, let's talk about lithium. Lithium, what's up with that? Lithium used to treat almost exclusively one disorder. And we don't use it that much anymore, but it's used to treat bipolar disorder. The way it works is it <laughs> stabilizes your availability of glutamate. So it makes it so you don't get too high or too low. And remember, people with bipolar disorder have issues of manic episodes of being way too happy and depressive episodes of being really sad. So lithium is a poison. It's the same stuff that's in batteries. It's a natural occurring salt. So if you have too much lithium, it's like food poisoning. You're green in the gills, thrown up everywhere. Blah, blah. But if you don't get enough, it doesn't even do anything. So you have to make sure that if someone's on lithium, you got to balance it out. I feel sorry for someone who's looking for a quick fix and raids someone's medicine cabinet and finds lithium. They're like, oh yeah, I need the high. And they start taking lithium. That's not going to get you high. That's just going to get you really sick. Another really quick interesting thing about lithium is that it is a naturally occurring salt. And back in Roman times, people used to go into the mountains and the hot springs and they were feeling really crazy. They said, you know what? You need some rest and relaxation. Go to the hot springs. And they'd sit in these hot springs and come back down after a weekend of relaxation in these hot tubs, basically, and they'd feel better. 
But nowadays we know in those hot tubs was lithium salt. So they were actually getting doses of lithium by just sitting in these hot tubs. All right, I only got like 30 seconds left on the clock I'm seeing here. So let's talk about antidepressant medications. Pretty simple. They help you with, with depression, major depressive. They make you feel happier. We have the older ones known as tricyclics and MAO inhibitors, which increase your serotonin. But the problem was people would get really overweight, they'd become really sedated, and it would take six weeks before they feel better. So that's no good. So then we came up with the, uh-oh, that means I'm out of time. I gotta wrap this thing up in the next minute or so before it cancels. So selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are what we use nowadays. These are your SSRIs. It increases your availability of serotonin because it selectively inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. So instead of giving you a whole bunch of artificial serotonin, it's your own serotonin staying in your synapse longer. The examples of SSRIs are Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil. They're very popular nowadays. Well, that's it for the first episode of the <laughs> chapter on disorders. I'm sorry, on therapies and treatments. When we come back next time, let's talk about psychoanalysis in part two. Yeah. Ah. Uh.